We ruined the timeline, it's all thanks to the damn Jester. Now you may have seen this game recently, but to sum it up, the game Lil Guardsman has us following 12 year old Lil as they find themselves working as guardsmen controlling who's allowed in and out of the city. However, as the game goes on, we find ourselves thrust into political conflict, conspiracies, revolutions, and active warfare, being the sole person with full control over the future of the sprawl. Now ever since that dude started their playthrough, I got pretty invested with the game. So invested that I soon bought the game for myself and quickly found myself very interested in the peculiar be. So I began writing down notes in the case I found anything interesting and oh boy do I think I found it. Because let me tell you, there's a lot of weird things here that point to a whole new story. And we and the gesture are the cause of everything. So sit back as I show you why Lil wasn't dreaming. Oh and also this will spoil the game's ending, so yeah. Okay, so if we're gonna start with anything, let's start with the very first thing that we see at the start of the game. You see, the game starts out with a dream. This dream is done in the storybook-like manner, showing how Lil brought peace and prosperity by deciding who came in and who didn't. In this, they did a great job, however, at the end, it said that the last decision they made was the wrong choice, causing the kingdom to be engulfed in flames and for the city to be doomed. After this, Lil wakes up from the dream, exclaiming that it was a nightmare. But immediately after this, we are indeed given guard shed duty while our dad gambles. However, there are several occasions in which the game highlights dreams and their connections to alternate timelines. Most blatant of this is in the So You Think You Can Save a Princess game show. In the game show, you can pick between three people, a barbarian, a mage, and a rogue. However, what's important here is the mage. During the game show, we can ask numerous questions. In the third round, we have an option labeled prophetic dreams, where we ask, You're having a dream, and you witness your own death. How does that impact your morning routine? If we ask this to Articulous Flame Hands, he gives this response. Dreams are a gateway into other realities. Death is a dream is your subconscious showing you how another version of yourself in a parallel universe has expired. Any of a series of choices splinters our universe into fragments. So I mourn my fellow me's and I am heartbroken that another version of myself has perished. It is a dark omen and should be heeded accordingly. This isn't the only time we hear about alternate realities either. We hear about them so much that it's a core part of the story. There's an unavoidable cutscene where you face a demon in an alternate reality, and of course the very end of the game has us going through multiple alternate realities as we try to stop Heroinus and Thanatos from using the chronometer to change the timeline and enslave all non-magical creatures. But here's where the connection is practically confirmed. You see, no matter what ending you get, whether best or worst, you will get the same epilogue text for B, who dies at the end of the game. We'll talk more in detail about it in a bit, but her epilogue text text says that Lil has dreams of her traveling through alternate sprawls. So after B, the person who gave Lil the chronometer and knows more about all this timeline stuff than anyone, dies, Lil continues to have dreams of her. But how is this relevant? Well, I believe that the dream at the start of the game was actually the main timeline, and that our whole playthrough is actually an entirely different universe from the one B originally came from. B is trying to find the perfect timeline after our actions unintentionally caused the end of the world. Now this may sound loaded, but as with all my theories, I've got Fruit. Lots of it. So let's get started. To start off, when you first get the chronometer, you can choose to get exposition if you want to. If you choose to listen to her, she'll tell a lot of world building about power crystals. Specifically, she states the power crystals have a raw and ethereal property, which when transmuted can cause anomalies in time. The use of the word ethereal in particular strongly implies the crystals are powered by death or have some strong association with it. They even have a pun snuck in where its crystals were discovered by a metal band, a death metal band. Point being that they are directly tied with death. And what do you get when you mix death with time machines? Quantum immortality. Keep this in mind. Later in the game, there's a point where because the chronometer is glitching out and acting weird, we try to go to the dig site to talk with B, to which they are gone on a meeting. During this, we have the option to use the chronometer, which if we do, we trigger a catastrophic rift in the space-time continuum, and game over. It's stated that this is because the chronometer is tethered to the guard shed, something told to us numerous times. We can only use it in the guard shed. B set it up to only work properly there. But there's a problem with this. A big problem. At the very end of the game, we have to stop Tyronius from using the chronometer. However, it is used to go back to the wedding. Not only is it used in the palace, much farther away than B's dig site, but it teleports us to a different part of the castle. Never when we use it does it teleport us. It only takes us from the guard shed to the guard shed. Even when we go to another reality, we are still in the same spot in the guard shed. So for it to teleport us to, that would be much more difficult as it would have to specifically change our position. So how come it works here multiple times in a circumstance that should be much harder and riskier, but doesn't at B's office where she'd have tested it before. Well, if B's done this before, they'd attune it to work at the palace too, right? I believe B set it up in advance because she 
she knew this was gonna happen. Another more minor thing is some dialogue we get at the dig site close to the end of the game. B is panicking and checks to see if we are in a time loop. But why would they be in a time loop? After all, we're the ones with the only chronometer, right? Upon ensuring that they aren't stuck in a time loop, they upgrade something of our choosing and vaguely worry about the upcoming disaster, refusing to elaborate when asked. B also tells us that they themselves have been testing the device for months prior to giving it to us, claiming to have repeated the same day over and over again to learn the oboe, for example, which would make it a lot less new and experimental than B lets on when she first shows it to us. Another contradiction. But you're all probably thinking about one moment right now. Although we don't see it ourselves, Ourselves, B dies in the hole at the dig site, being pushed in by Tyronius and their lackey goblin. Or did they? You see, B's body was never recovered, sure, but they were thrown to a pit which was full of power crystals. That, and prior to this, if we go to the dig site while B isn't there, we can check the hole ourselves. The first time we click, we get a power crystal, but the second time we fall in and get a game over. However, the game over dialogue explicitly doesn't say we died. It instead says Lil tumbled in and was lost. Not that they died, mind you, but that they were lost. And lastly, although B tries to act cordial with you, you may notice she constantly makes minor jabs at us, and after playing into her want for adventure, puts us in charge of the chronometer, a device they tell everyone else is too dangerous, but gladly gives to a 12 year old. Once we've agreed to use this device that could split the universe in half, she becomes much more snarky and cold towards us. You've gotta take it back. Sh got too real with your chronometer 3000 thing today. Hi, B. So nice to see you, B. Your paper in the Journal of Dwarven Medicine was a revelation, B. No way I'm handing my research over to you. Not until I see the full effects on my human test guinea pig here. Yeah. Wait, what? We both knew what this was. Oh my, were you left behind? Feel free to wait in the lost and found box until someone comes to collect you. Well, excuse me, but I was just pulled into what I'm guessing was a parallel dimension and was almost murdered by a demon. Hmm. How unfortunate. I always wondered what the byproduct of St. Bartholomew Inglebrook's lunar incantation would have on the relationship between time and interplanar folding. Just take it back. I'm sorry, I truly am, but we've come too far. B shows very little care or remorse for Lil's well-being, which doesn't make very much sense. It's not even done in a you're an annoying kid way either. It's like they actively have something against us but are being forced to work with us specifically. Well, here's my theory. I think that like I said before, the dream at the start is the main timeline. And after we mess it up somehow, B was forced to use their own chronometer to go back into another timeline. And once she did, every time that she falls to the dig site's power crystal pit, she resets to a new timeline to try again. And through this, she knows that we're the only ones who can make that difference. She knows we'll be working at the guard shed again. She knows we'll be the ones deciding who the princess should marry. She knows we decide who's drafted into the war. And we decide the very fate of this world. To put it simply, we ruined her life and the lives of everyone. But for the sake of finding a timeline where everything is okay and she lives, she must talk with us again and again knowing full well that we were responsible for the hellish cycle that she's been forced to go through. How can I be so sure about that whole main timeline thing? I mean, sure, B is suspicious, but what could have happened? After all, shouldn't Tyronius be the one at fault? Why are we the ones getting the snarky comments? Well, I might have an idea or two. To start, we should probably deduce what happened in that timeline, and from there we can figure out why we may be at fault. To start off, the advisors are the three characters that are constantly shown to be corrupt in their own way. Stryker is very black and white, Ash is racist and posh, and Malcolm, well, I'm Malcolm. Let's talk about that. Malcolm is near constantly shown to be an outsider compared to Stryker and Ash. There's the very first conversation we have with them, there's his role of being a jester, and yet he's shown to have just as much influence as the military general and the royal advisor. He's always shown as being the one out place, the oddball, the joke option that should never be taken too seriously. However, he's far from just a joke option. In fact, he's been shown to trick, manipulate, and swindle all for his own perpetual gain and amusement, such as having a member of a grieving pet family smuggle drugs into their cat's coffin without the family knowing, or by tricking us into doing their bidding no matter how nefarious or unreasonable. We're told that Malcolm has a dog-eat-dog -dog mentality, and if they ruled, they'd likely remove all rules and lead the kingdom into a lawless anarchy. Either way, they show themselves to be most interested in causing chaos or helping themselves. Being the court jester for King 
Oswin, he shouldn't have been very high up, but once King Oswin died, the sprawl hasn't been the same and has fallen into an era of chaos. So naturally, he stepped up to the plate in hopes of ensuring that it never returns to order. They even have a bust of the king in their room with his jester hat slapped onto the head of the bust. And when interacted with, it tells us it was stolen, like how Malcolm wants to steal the crown for himself. Note and post here, I just noticed that there's also a painting behind him portraying himself as king. You can't get more subtle than this, folks. On the other hand, Ash is the complete opposite, wanting extreme order. Echo tells us that if she had the chance, she'd make everyone think the exact same way, certainly against what Malcolm wants. As a matter of fact, Ash has a very deep connection with Tyronius. If the first time we meet Tyronius, we use truth spray and find out his plan, but we then call Ash, she'll instruct us to let him inside, to which the daily epilogue text will show that he's thankful for her influence allowing his entry. Ash helped Tyronius, whom is the one responsible for killing the previous king. And that's not a theory, a game theory, because of this secret interaction you can get from using the x-ray on the ghost finders, where we see the ghost of the king revealing that he was killed via poison in the ear. A Hamlet reference that happens to reveal a massive bomb in the lore, especially as Ash has a massive problem with other races, which goes against how King Oswin was apparently leading the way for peace among all races. So given their connection and their sheer distaste for people unlike themselves, Ash has a pretty good chance of being complicit in Tyronius' assassination plot. Point being, both Malcolm and Ash both have been biding their time to try and gain control of the sprawl. Now I think they're the main catalyst to what happened in the last timeline. But what's our connection? Now this is something I totally thought was going to be revealed at the end of the game, but seeing it's not, I have a lot of evidence for Lil being part of the royal bloodline of the sprawl. The biggest foreshadowing for this being when the princess sneaks into the sprawl and informs us of her identity, where after making us choose who to marry, she drops this line. Thank you for your honesty. I know my advisors have jerked you around, but I also know you don't always do what they say, and I like that. You remind me of, well, me. And you remind me of me too. If I was rich and beautiful and influential. Oh, you are influential. You've changed the course of fate more than you know. Don't forget beautiful. I am also beautiful. So right away the game's saying, yeah, Lil is just Desdemona under different circumstances. Due to Lil's humble background, she can properly stand up for herself in a way that the princess can't due to being surrounded by the most powerful, cunning people of the sprawl. However, her interactions with Lil inspire her to stand up to Tyronius, who again has strong ties to Ash and is the direct cause of King Oswin's death. And then the game highlights her similarities with her again. Why the princess listens to you, I will never understand. It's like you're the only two people in the dead mum's club. My mother's terrible. That should count for something. But there's more than just that. Sure, I can mention that their hair color is similar, but that's not hard enough. Let's instead look at the propaganda video from level 8. Now, it's important to know that characters come in all sorts of sizes. Every character, whether male or female, will overall look very distinct, even amongst their own race. Looking at the propaganda video, this appears to be a younger drawing of King Oswin, as the poster is shown immediately afterwards, shown with a white beard, but here we see that the beard is dark when put in grayscale. If we compare these to the similarly drawn images of her father in the intro, we can immediately see some similarities. Hilly beard with these thick rectangular eyebrows and large blocky three-fingered hands. And mind you, these are details not even the princess, who we know has blood ties with, doesn't. Notice how her hair comes in sharp triangles, unlike the king's dolor triangles, and her thin eyebrows. The concept art for her father makes the similarity even more obvious, given the exact same hilly beard shape made up of rounded off triangles. Now, originally, I thought the fact that both our mothers were dead was a hint that we secretly shared the same mother. However, that'd be impossible. Like, how are you gonna hide that you're pregnant as a queen in medieval times? But these similarities between Hamish, our father, and King Oswin implies that this may go back even further, which would mean that Lil is cousins with Prince Desdemona. Hey, uh, last minute in post, I'm re-recording this after I just re-recorded all the footage because the footage got messed up. Um, turns out there's this section in the credits where uh, it'll show the photos of all of Lil's ancestors. And I don't know how it took me this long to realize it because I looked here earlier for comparing Lil's father, but basically one of Lil's ancestors has a crown, or appears to have a crown. So if anybody, it's probably this one who was the start of the blood ties between the two. It's probably this one. The most compelling evidence in my opinion, and probably the weirdest place to put lore, is the Steam Points Shop. Now you have your typical emotes here, you got the chronometer, the device Lil has been using this entire game, the heart symbol that's shown on Lil's shirt, and most intriguing of all, a crown called Lil Crown. L-I-L. -L. 
Why is this compelling? Little never wears a crown. In fact, this exact crown does not show up on any character in the game. This crown appears to be rather small as well, only having room for three prongs and being circular, almost like it was made specifically to fit a 12 year old child's head. And this is my cue to tell you what I think happened in the other timeline. You see, I believe that in the original timeline, Hamish or the family at some point learned of their royal lineage and returned to the royal family, still working as gate guards, but now being seen as possible heirs to the throne. Hamish has been stated several times to be lazy, so he's of no concern. You and I both know my dad has a tendency to half-ass his way through life. Tell me why he needs to whole-ass it all of a sudden and strive for anything above two stars. Well, however, she's perfect, but not for the reasons you think. Remember, the advisors have had power because the princess hadn't reached adulthood yet, and was thus not allowed to make decisions and was deemed a princess rather than a queen, which is why the princess was being forced to pick a suitor and all that. And with the princess now mature, she's hard to control. As she says herself, they want me out of the way so they can control my father's kingdom. But you know what's easier to manipulate? A 12 year old child. They had control up until this point because the princess hadn't reached adulthood. So with the princess becoming more trouble than they're worth, who's to say Ash wouldn't just hire themselves another hitman again? So the clock resets and they again have near ultimate power. Remember that decision that caused the whole town to be covered in fire and doom everyone? Well, that final decision is very vague. Although it mentioned that Lil helped ensure only the right people went into the sprawl, it only ever said that this was Lil's last decision. You know what would stop her from making any more decisions? The advisors, specifically if she picked one. The advisors always butted heads with one another, which allowed for the player and by proxy the princess to follow the advisors while still making choices that one or more of them disagreed with. None of them could just do their own thing because if they did, the other two would stop them. However, all it would take is one decision to pick one of them alone to help quote unquote guide them. And just like that, they would be unable to do anything about it. Any objections she had could just be thrown under the guise of she's just a rebellious kid who doesn't Know what they're talking about. And I doubt this happened fairly either. Remember how Malcolm tricked us at the start of the game to do whatever they say, no matter how nefarious or unreasonable, by hiding the ball under their foot? They also do this to the pixie dust smuggler later on, so they seem to use this trick as their go-to when they want something. So who's to say he wouldn't pull that ultimatum here too? If you guess wrong, appoint me as your sole advisor, and if you guess right, tacos. Uh, yeah, tacos. But of course, Ash, being the total opposite, would hate this. So when Malcolm gains unparalleled political power and essentially becomes the ruler of the Sprawl, Ash wouldn't be too pleased with that. In other endings, particularly the one where the Sprawl doesn't win the war, Ash fights back. Although here, she joins Pritchard as a spy on the inside. Should the Sprawl become something so opposite to her, I don't think she'd have much of a problem with doing a heel face turn in the name of order. As such, war would break out near instantly, engaging from other smaller skilled attacks like that of the mole people kill everyone as we know it. So TLDR, the original timeline is one where Lil and the other advisors are aware of their royal lineage, and because of that, the princess is killed much like her father for being too rebellious, and Malcolm tricks Lil into firing the other advisors and having him alone. This causes total anarchy, which in turn causes Ash to switch sides to Pritchard, like she does in the loss ending, resulting in war and the deaths of everyone. But enough of the alternate timeline, because there's even more to this theory, something that has been in our guard shed this entire time. At any point before the war, our guard shed is filled with clutter. You can see a teapot, some confiscated weapons, but on the top shelf you can see something peculiar to say the least. A skull and what appears to be a prototype of the Chronometer 3000. You can tell because of the gold top, white glass, and the triangular gem at the bottom with a pink tinge, although it looks much duller. Given how the power crystals can be spent, this is likely due to it having already been used, whereas the current version seems to have fixed that problem. Problem, as we never really find ourselves needing to charge it back up with a new one. One of the few characters to know about the chronometer is Echo, the weed mage. Echo is stated to have founded the Mage's Guild, having been around for over a millennia. During one of their dialogues, you can show them the chronometer, to which he tells us that people have been tinkering for years trying to make one, and becomes visibly shaken, showing that it's possible that B has been making one before the whole end of the world thing, and that this is probably one of them. But what's more interesting is this skull, because we see skulls near constantly, like so many characters have skulls either 
either in the room or on their person. And I think this is a nod from the developers telling us who was involved with that old timeline, both directly and indirectly. There's just one of the guard shit showing that both us and our father were involved. Dr. B, of course, also has a skull, but it's not just any skull. It's specifically a cat skull. Likely a parallel to how a cat has nine lives and how B, with her quantum immortality, has just as many, if not more. Ash has a skull in their bookshelf alongside a book on the habits of the most successful dictators. The Declaration of War obviously has a skull, as well as the War Screen. Tyronius has a skull during the night shift encounter. One of the goblins from the Goblin Liberation Army has a skull earring. Skulls are so prominent they even appear in the game's logo. And wouldn't you know it, there's even an emote for that too in the Steam Point store. Oh, how it all nicely weaves together. Most importantly of all, Malcolm has so many skulls, oh god. There's one behind the cat poster, two with candles on them, and there appears to be a dragon skull up top judging by the holes and hollow eyes. The knocker for the room has a skull on it too, and wouldn't you know it, it's exactly Lil's height. And most damning of all, one of Malcolm's bells on their hat is a mini skull, with him being the person wholly responsible for this. But with it being Lil's decision, of course she'd get the blame, and of course B would hold their contempt with them. But although it eventually led to a good timeline for Lil, where she gets to be friends with the princess and have a childhood, it won't stop B from searching for the perfect timeline, where she doesn't have to die. And perhaps while she's at it, one where nobody does. That's all for this time, folks. I'll see you around. Peace!